axiomatic warfare and the fatal flaws of modern fascism. Introduction to modern fascism. Repeat a lie often enough and it becomes the truth. Joseph Goebbels. Axioms are our base assumptions about the world. They act as filters for new information coming into our consciousness. In classical philosophy, an axiom is a statement so evident and so well established that it's accepted without controversy or question. As used in modern logic, an axiom is a premise or starting point for reasoning. We use these axiomatic assumptions to build our internal models of the world around us. They allow us to compare new information we receive from the outside world with our internal models, which helps us decide whether to reject or accept that new information. They are, for want of a better word, your common sense beliefs. So how do you go about changing a relatively normal person's core beliefs and base assumptions to the point that they're rejecting their fellow citizens as traitors? How do people end up committing terrorist violence, blowing up hundreds, misguided vigilantes, white supremacists shooting or running down protesters, ISIS beheadings or even mass genocide? Shock treatment and slow repetition. When as a child I was subject to regular abuse from my dad, I'd see my mother beaten repeatedly and she'd flee to women's refuges where I'd stay with her. And each time my mum left, whenever I visited my dad at weekends, he would constantly pressure me and manipulate me into trying to convince her to get him back together. This never worked of course, but what it did do is make me highly sensitive to manipulative techniques. From an early age I was fascinated by people like Darren Brown and Naomi Klein who both revealed the tricks of the trade that advertising and marketing industries use to convince people to do things. One way of changing people into killing machines or obedient sheep is through a big shock to the system, like how electroshock therapy allows for a clean slate to rebuild people's internal mental models. Psychedelics are another way, having a similar effect on the brain as shock. Encouraged by the alt-right and alt-light influence like Jordan Peterson and Rebel Wisdom as they try to red pill people an expression taken from the Matrix film as a metaphor for revealing the truth about the world. The 1940s have been a decade of breakthroughs and developments in medicine and psychiatry. Scientists have developed a new technology to cure mentally ill adults. With the use of electro shocks, the minds of sick patients are being wiped clean, giving them a fresh start. On this blank slate, physicians then imprint a new, healthy personality. They use shock and disorientation as a way to prepare a blank slate in order to rebuild people's internal axiomatic models with different core beliefs, remaking people by shocking them into obedience gaslighting them about their existing internal mental models, making them seem silly, irrational or outdated, reducing them to the mental state of a child, and then rebuilding them with a new ideology or worldview, which is known as shock therapy. It's a fundamental hypothesis of this handbook that these techniques are in essence methods of inducing regression of the personality. There is an interval, which may be extremely brief, of suspended animation, a kind of psychological shock or paralysis. Experienced interrogators recognize this effect when it appears and know that at this moment the source is far more open to suggestion, far likelier to comply than he was just before he experienced the shock. As Naomi Klein explains in The Shock Doctrine, The Rise of Disaster Capitalism, these techniques work on large scales with trauma to influence political outcomes. This technique has been used since at least Milton Friedman coined the term economic shock treatment. He advised that politicians push through painful and popular policies all at once during a time of a crisis before people could regain their footing. They can work on whole societies, a collective trauma, a war, a coup, a natural disaster, a terrorist attack, puts us all into a state of shock. And in reality... The techniques are used in economic markets on a large scale, and also on an individual, small scale. Economics and politics are just interactions on a large scale after all. Regular repetition and slow suggestion can also instill new axiomatic models and core beliefs into people's minds, 
as Darren Brown demonstrates how powerful subtle suggestion can be alone, without the need for hypnosis, shock or drugs. But using combination, shock and repetition can shift people until they've moved their positions, perceptions and beliefs about the world to a place they could never have imagined. But luckily, once you understand the deception and understand how the trick works, the illusion begins to fall apart. Defining and deconstructing modern fascism. Firstly, we must define modern fascism. Modern fascism ticks every box of the traditional definitions using the Umberto Eco's era fascism. And not only does it fulfill every criteria, it reveals other motivational forces. It has evolved to include new aspects and changed into something much worse. While its main weakness remains the same, the fact that it's primarily motivated by weakness. As General Franco said in 1938 interview, fascism presents, wherever it manifests itself, characteristics which are varied to the extent that countries and national temperaments may vary. It is essentially a defense reaction of the organism, a manifestation of the desire to want to live, not to die. At certain times, it seizes a whole people, so each people reacts in its own way according to its conception of life. This quote not only illustrates perfectly the transient nature of the ideology, but also the core motivations of fascism. It's an ideology based on the assumption of weakness, which yearns for restoration of a past greatness. But the way it manifests itself is different in each place and period that it takes hold. Therefore the aim of this is not to make the case that any one particular person, party or country has embraced outright fascism. Plenty of other people have made that case already. The aim of this is to reveal the underlying motivations, highlight the threats, weaknesses and analyse the less obvious effects of modern fascism. But we can no longer pretend that fascism is restricted to only the fringes of society. There's one other thing I've learned from my study of states of shock. Shock wears off. It is by definition a temporary state. And the best way to stay oriented, to resist shock, is to know what is happening to you and why. History doesn't repeat, but it rhymes. A false equivalence that's often made recently is that liberal imperialism is just the same as fascism. And while it's true that imperialists use fascist dictators to extract cheap labour and resources, and to dominate smaller countries in a similar way to how fascist empires aspire to rule. The key difference is that populations of those countries aren't gripped by the same kind of fear and delusions. More egalitarian, liberal democracies are much better equipped to hold their imperial position of power long term because they're better able to assess the risks and act accordingly rather than overreact based on paranoia and competing egos under excessive pressure. This false equivalence was also used in 1930s Germany because the far left communists had been co-opted and infiltrated by fascists. They would repeat the mantra, the social democrats or the SDP are the real racists, contrary to the assumption of most people. Fascism as an ideological phenomena and as a political system of government is very distinct from white supremacy or even racism. It does of course include white supremacy and racists, but in fact it also includes other groups who have been co-opted by fascist propaganda or who implicitly support and enable their agendas. Examples of modern opposition that have been infiltrated or simply made up by fascists include innumerable groups and conspiracy theories like Blue Lives Matter, Black Nationalists, the Boogaloo Movement who call for a race war, and the Proud Boys and even sometimes supposed anarchists, far left communists and accelerationists. Motivations of Fascism Fascism distilled down to its core reason for existing is the suppression of the opposition who represent workers' rights and economic justice. Fascism is an economic shock doctrine practiced upon inhabitants of the country. Western governments don't spread fascist propaganda in tin pot dictators like Pinochet of Chile because we care about indigenous people after all. We install fascist dictators in order to remove workers' rights and open up access to their natural resources, so the fascist leaders patently don't look after their own people. Instead, they con their people into subjugation of the state by generating jingoistic fear of the other, whoever is convenient on that day to blame for their problems. Artificial moral panics can be engineered and real disasters used to allow corrupt oligarchs and financial predators to consolidate their power further 
by buying up small innovative businesses who don't have the excess capital to survive the turmoil on their own or as a way to eradicate public services by sabotaging them and building mistrust. So a major motivation of fascism is to simply suppress the opposition left-wing party. Populists claim to be against the kind of free trade that neoliberals advocate for, and to some extent they are, but whenever they try they fail because they are interfering with the emergent markets that adapt to restrictions and trade, and they also end up treading on the toes of their financial and industrial backers. So instead they retreat and concede to the power of the market domination by rich people. They only use their threats of trade barriers as merely more economic shock treatment for market price volatility rather than protecting actual jobs and vital industries. This is a similar trick played by neoliberals too. But while neoliberals use fascism as a tool for opening markets for imperialism, they do differ from libertarians, not only because libertarians embrace guns and weed, but because they're starting from a different position to achieve the same goal. Neoliberals seek to remove the already existing public services and workers' rights that lift up bargaining power, but libertarians want to stop the government from ever providing those services and investments into the poor or enshrining workers' rights in the first place. Modern fascism has two core cool reasons to exist, fear and greed. I've been researching and analysing how economic systems differ using a SWOT analysis, which is strengths, weaknesses, opportunities and threats. For each economic system I tried to be as neutral, fair and balanced as possible, which included fascism. It might seem strange that someone who's anti-fascist would want to explore the strengths and opportunities of fascist ideologies and tendencies, but in doing so it's revealed the real weaknesses and threats, which are too important for us to ignore. So what exactly is fascism? Is it just an economic doctrine? or a personal philosophy about the world? And the answer is both. The ideology has two core reasons to exist, in fact, and two distinct audience types, with one based primarily on fear and the other on greed, and with each having a malignant and symbiotic relationship with each other. Fear is the authoritarian conservative fascists. Greed is the libertarian fascists. There are very few people who actually buy into the full-on fascist ideology. Most believe a watered-down version which resembles libertarianism, conservatism, right-wing populism or accelerationism and most of them genuinely believe they aren't in fact fascist even though they're being constantly fed subtle suggestions of fascist ideology or ideologies which align with fascist plans. One of the most ironic things about modern fascism is that the groups are mostly being used by libertarian globalist elites pulling a confidence trick on the host nation, often posing as anti-establishment conspiracists who actually just uphold the establishment status quo through misinformation and distrust in the media, making people skeptical of the government. See Russia Today and YouTube Bitcoin shills who subtly suggest fascist talking points too, with those rich libertarians at the top more than happy with those below them who they deem less worthy, living in even more delusional ideologies with fake or disproportionate threats and enemies to fear, often resembling traditional Christian values but wrapped in modern conspiracies about George Soros, Bill Clinton, with added elements of satanic panic resembling the elders of Zion conspiracy theory from the early 20th century that inspired Hitler and others. Modern fascism has clearly inspired similar modern day equivalents of brown shirts and black shirts, the self-styled vigilantes like QAnon, Proud Boys, the Boogaloo white nationalist violent extremists who want to accelerate towards a full-on race war. It's also infiltrated numerous other alternative groups, such as hyper-evangelical end times cults, alternative health scenes, internet conspiracy scenes like Flat Earth and, and Occult Magic. A missing hallmark of fascism, which was actually present in 20th century fascism, is controlled opposition and suppression of opposition parties using disinformation. During the times of fascism, magical thinking, fantasies, political thought bubbles are a common theme with people living in delusional custom realities resembling an episode of Black Mirror. They act as a coping mechanism or escape mechanism, especially during the COVID-19 lockdown. These tendencies have gone into overdrive, with massive events entering the real world, featuring people like David Icke leading protesters alongside fascists, and we ignore the rise of fascism and climate destruction and the COVID death tolls. Using disasters like Covid or irrational scare tactics such as the satanic panic style fascist propaganda from QAnon can shock people using their fear and disgust response while making them distrust the news even more, allowing the government to evade valid criticism from experts while suggesting to people that the government public services are inherently evil or communist. This type of propaganda is a libertarian's wet dream making a population not only give up on collectively funded public services but actively fear them. An example is Donald Trump trying to discredit the US Postal Service 
or other public institutions and regulatory bodies. Anti-Semitism has always been used throughout history by those in power to provoke an us versus them mentality, leading to today's establishment still sanctioning and allowing QAnon on major media platforms, provoking and agitating terrorists from the far left even and the far right. It distorts a healthy society and poisons democracy, and I believe it has other unforeseen consequences and blowback. The fatal flaws of living in a fantasy. While the main flaws and weaknesses of fascism might remain the same, they are in fact exacerbated by this new hybrid model. Its main weakness, as I've said, is the fact that it's motivated by weakness, fear and greed, rather than true strength, self-confidence or heroic, benevolent power, as their adherents like you to believe. A misconception of fascists themselves is that they're based on strength, when in fact they're actually based on weakness, even when their driving force is greed rather than fear. Libertarian fascists want to extract labour and materials at cheap prices while inflating their own asset prices. In other words, international financiers with little allegiance to their country, ironically the very people that conservative fascists claim to be opposed to. Fascism also claims to make society stronger and more efficient and more successful, but it actually accelerates the destruction of the culture, country or people, rather than preserving it and conserving it or making it stronger, because it betrays a fundamental weakness or insecurity. Competitors and rivals can easily see through the charade and take advantage. So if anything, it does the exact opposite. China and Russia are clearly goading Western nations into becoming more divided and totalitarian, as they themselves benefit from becoming more liberal and open and reap the competitive advantages that brings. See Kraut's excellent video about Trump on China as an example. Whereas Keynesian investment in a country and people give more workers' rights, opportunities and more bargaining power, is what makes a country really successful and innovative, rather than the faux Keynesian policy of giving kickbacks to corrupt officials for government contracts and widening the inequality by supporting the already rich rather than the poor. So who benefits from this mimetic war? Who are we going to war with and who's winning? A modern adage is that tankies are just fascists because they support authoritarian proto-fascist leaders and regimes who claim to be communist. But from my experience talking to actual fascists, they actually crave a more multipolar world where the strong leaders rise up as competitors and they form alliances with dictators. So to me, it looks like fascists are the real tankies, wishing that enemies are stronger and wanting to accelerate towards a race war or civil war that weakens society. Not only did Donald Trump have knowledge that Russia was allowing ISIS bounties on US troops and withheld that knowledge from the public, he was also courting Putin at the same time. And I have personally heard white supremacists backing extremist Islamists in Discord servers. Militant Islamists and white supremacists in fact share many of values and core beliefs like antisemitism, accelerationist end times fantasies, patriarchal traditional values and fear of the outside progressive cultures. In fact, modern extremist white supremacist groups have been known to share recruitment and terrorist strategies with militant Islamists. You could even argue that fascism was inflicted by the Russian or imperialist propagandists onto the German people in order to take control of larger areas of Europe after the destabilisation of war. But these days fascism seems to be a rogue meme that no longer serves any particular host. It's pathologically damaging to any society or individual it happens to grip. Even the aforementioned libertarians and accelerationists who think they're benefiting are only temporarily gaining by market price volatility. They ultimately lose through the blowback effects and the whirlpool they create. Psychopathy, alienation, nihilism and insecurity. It's well established that fascist dictators are driven by psychopathic characteristics and tendencies. They either don't care about the truth or they disregard it if it's not convenient to their narrative. In totalitarian despotic societies, facts are often reversed in fact, as George Orwell proclaimed throughout his writings. War is peace, freedom is slavery, Ignorance is strength. As Hitler explained as well, if you tell a big enough lie, and tell it often enough, it will be believed, as he said in Mein Kampf. Thus, in the primitive simplicity of their minds, they more readily fall victim to the big lie rather than the small lie, since they themselves often tell small lies in little matters, but would be ashamed to resort to large-scale falsehoods. Similar to how authoritarian Stalinist communists harness people's alienation, and trick them into thinking that it's possible for the state to fully decommodify everything without having markets, money to account for things, domination by horror hierarchies, or to try and convince people that a revolution is just around the corner. But of course, a council of representatives is still just the head of an organisation, for all intents and purposes, because they wield executive power over others. 
even if the name has changed from the board of directors, a market for emergent properties when groups of humans want or need a certain commodity when it comes available. So the problem is when the power of markets are fetishized and worshipped and they no longer work for the benefit of society and instead become subservient to markets. Markets should work for the benefit of society, not the other way around. Certain economic truths have become accepted as self-evident. A second Bill of Rights, under which a new basis of security and prosperity can be established for all, regardless of station or race or creed. Among these are the right to a useful and remunerative job in the industries or shops or farms or mines throughout the nation. The right to earn enough to provide adequate food and clothing and recreation. The right of every farmer to raise and sell his products at a return which will give him and his family a decent living. The right of every businessman, large and small, to trade in an atmosphere of freedom freedom from unfair competition and domination by monopolies at home or abroad, the right of every family to a decent home, the right to adequate medical care and the opportunity to achieve and enjoy good health, the right to adequate protection from the economic fears of old age, sickness, accidents, and unemployment, the right to a good education. All of these rights spell security. But while communist and fascist ideologies are based on lies that harness people's alienation, envy and fear, fascism is especially appealing to the weak. So fascism betrays to others the inherent fundamental weakness. Like the insecure kid at school that lashes out, others around can see that it's because of their own insecurity which makes them appear even weaker. Fascism is a psychopathy driven by insecurity. When people become so absorbed in an ideology, there's a phenomena where people actually self-identify with the ideology, brand or even celebrity culture. It's called identity protective cognition. People's identity and self-worth becomes attached so tightly to a belief system or ideology that when they encounter new information that contradicts their worldview, it's almost seen as a personal attack on them themselves. Therefore, irrational, emotional, quick thinking is the default when there is either too much pressure or they feel attacked. There's no longer the use of the slow, effortful thinking. My Anarchist Analysis the problem with viewing the world through just one lens of analysis, or bucket of knowledge as Professor Sapolsky would say, is that you fall into unnecessarily reductive thinking. Here's an example. Why should you do this? Where did the example go? Here's one of the classic continua that we ever deal with, which is the continua of color, the varying wavelengths that take the rainbow from violet to red, and there's an infinite number of spaces in between. And what do we do? We have rules in English that you divide the continua here and here or whatever, and that's what you call a color. This is red, everything from here is red, everything here is orange, so on. You take a continua and you break it into boundaries. Why do we do that? Because it makes it easier to store the information away. Instead of remembering the absolute features of something, you simply say, it's A. It's a sub four minute miler. It's a line that's almost the length, that's about the length of a ruler. It's the color orange. How do you know that's the case? Because go and take people from other language groups where their language arbitrarily divides the rainbow at other points with completely different color terms, and they remember different profiles of colors differently than an English speaker might. Take a color, and if the color comes right in the center of somebody's color categorization, if it comes right in the middle of the range of what counts as that color, people remember whether they saw that color or not far better than if you show them a color at the boundary. And people will show that as a function of what language they speak. Taking a continua and you break it into pieces because it's easier to deal with the facts. 
Another example, when you pay too much attention to boundaries, you don't see the big picture. But as you just saw, there are these problems. First one being, when you think in categories, you underestimate how different two facts are when they fall in the same category. When you think in categories, you overestimate how different they are when there happens to be a boundary in between them. And when you pay attention to categorical boundaries, you don't see big pictures. An endocrinologist and say, well, the female had certain levels of estrogen in her bloodstream, which made this key hypothalamic areas responsive to the stimulus. Or you could answer it like an anatomist of saying, well, because the fulcrum of her pelvis or whatever it is chickens have that allow them to run. Or you could answer it in the category of an evolutionary biologist that over the millennia, chickens that didn't respond to sexually solicitive <laughs> gestures from males left fewer copies of their genes. And there's all these different categories that we can use to explain what's going on. I describe myself as a philosophical anarchist, not a full-on anarchist, which does not mean that I want total chaos and disorder. It means that I want the optimal solution to emerge, including the unique experiences from the bottom. I think that a bottom-up or anarchist lens of analysis is necessary for society to run cohesively in an optimal state. If it's repressed, it distorts the overall picture of reality for everyone similar to a CEO that doesn't listen to his employees or workers on the ground. I interpret anarchism as constantly holding authority to account to justify its existence and reason for dominating others. I also believe it's every citizen's responsibility to hold authority to account. I think anarchists would be necessary under any economic system or society to stop corruption and tyranny. Anarchists also believe in stigmatic rhizomatic action to make the world a better place organically not from a top-down authority which fascism seeks to instill on society. This approach has parallels in evolutionary biology, which a central issue is being able to adapt to changing environments. Human beings are collectively part of a bigger, chaotic, but stable system known as a complex adaptive system. Complex adaptive systems are chaotic systems that reach states of steady equilibrium. Thus, by definition, this cannot be a system where knowing the starting state allows you to know the mature system without having to go through every single calculation. And knowing the mature state doesn't tell you what the starting state was unless you're willing to do all the back calculations because it's not reductive in that sense. Where would this begin to sort of manifest itself? Okay, into the chaos book, and I think it was page 27 or so, that you get the water wheel coming up for the first time, and go and look at this picture, obsess over it, understand what that page is about, because it begins to show how these properties of non-linear aperiodicity wind up producing chaotic systems. Okay, so you've got this water wheel, and it's got these buckets here, and they've got holes in the bottom, and you can have a very simple steady state. You just put in a little bit of water, such that the water is basically, as soon as it gets here, it's running out, it's coming out to the same state. This never fills, the water wheel doesn't turn. Now you begin to fill up at a higher rate, and what that does is it's a little bit asymmetrical. This is heavy enough that it now begins to push the wheel down. And as it's going down, this next one is getting filled in this next one, and all the while it's emptying out. So constant input of water, a rate of things emptying, the wheel turns. It's possible to get a rate at which you're pouring water into the system where it will do precisely that for the rest of time. It will turn at a set speed. It is a steady state, it is in the equilibrium state. It is stable such that if you sit here right now and somebody tells you under in this a circumstance like this, the wheel is turning this fast in this direction with this force, you can sit there and you can tell them thus exactly what it will be doing 4,070 years from now on Tuesday afternoon. It is a periodic system. You don't have to sit there and go through every second between now and 4,000 years from now. It is steady state, and you can apply a periodic. There's periodicity. There's a reductive quality to it. Now, what you do is you put in the water with a little more force. And what begins to happen is the wheel turns faster because it's filling up with water faster, so it's moving this way faster, and that's great, that's totally logical, but at some point, if you're doing that, there's going to be too little time 
for these buckets to empty out, they're going to start having more water when they're coming up on this side because it's moving fast enough that they're not emptying and at some point there's going to be enough water left here that it will suddenly change direction. In the doubling process, something happens. And the something that happens is it becomes a nonlinear chaotic system. As you increase the force on the system, the force here being the force of water coming in there, at some point with the force of water increasing, it's going to stop this perfect periodic doubling of the components and it's going to shift over to a chaotic pattern now. Emergence and complexity, a human sociobiological analysis. In management, high pressure causes chaos which actually stops hierarchies of competence from emerging, while randomness actually enhances the optimal solution in adaptive networks. Too much pressure makes the adaptive system break down at a certain point. Yet fascist tendencies try to reduce the variability in culture and outcomes, which causes that weakness of having less adaptability, as Professor Sapolsky explains. They got the majority of people voting for the right answer, and this is more wisdom of the crowd. And this was a much better hit rate than whoever the expert was on the other side of the phone. One person could be extremely expert, but they're not going to be as expert as a whole bunch of somewhat decent experts thrown together. This is the notion behind a field called prediction markets, where what you do is you are trying to predict some event. For example, the Pentagon is very interested in using prediction markets to try to predict where the next terrorist attack might be. And what you do is you get a whole bunch of experts and you ask each of them to think about whatever the parameters are and take a guess as to how long it will be before the next one occurs. And what you do is you average them up and assume there's a wisdom of the crowd thing going on and that will give you lots of information. So what we have over and over here is this business of put a lot of somewhat decent experts together on a problem and they will be more accurate than almost any one single amazing expert at it under a few conditions. The collection of these partial experts can't be biased or if they are, they all have to be biased in a random scattering of directions and they need to really do be somewhat expert. If you get a whole bunch of people off the subway in New York and ask them to guess, guess the weight of the oxen, they are not going to wisdom of the crowd their way into being able to milk the thing afterwards. You've got to have people who have some experience with it. And you wind up seeing wisdom of the crowd stuff going on in all sorts of living systems. For example, here is an ant colony and here's a dead ant and they're trying to get the dead ant back to the ant colony and when you look at these things, they know how to get it or they get some dead beetle or something to eat and a whole bunch of ants push it over back to their colony. Oh, does each one of them know exactly where they should be pushing? No, what you have instead is each ant has somewhat of the right idea as to where they should be going and there's more ants that have a reasonably accurate notion, a smaller number that are somewhat off, a really small number that are way out of whack because in general ants are kind of experts at finding ant colonies, they're pretty informed and what you do is you put them all together and you do this vector geometry stuff and it moves perfectly in that direction and no single ant knows exactly where the colony is, you've got a wisdom of the crowd thing here going on. The variability is not just noise in a complex adaptive system. The variability is the system. It's fractal and scale free. The noise and variability is an intrinsic part of the system. And likewise, the system doesn't function properly when the agreed upon parameters that individuals believe to be true aren't universal enough to have any form of group coherence for a networked wisdom of crowds effect to emerge. Birds and swarms of animals produce amazing complex phenomena which are greater than the sum of their individual parts. The same kind of network effect emerges once a certain threshold and certain conditions and rules are met. These rules can be very simple like repulsion and attraction or staying a certain distance apart while travelling in a similar direction but collectively they create patterns that emerge with complexity and dare I say a certain amount of beauty. different cities, these different locales, and their rule is each one of them goes to another city. 
Each one of them goes to another destination. But here's the following rule. The ants are leaving a pheromone trail. Pheromone trail, they stick their rear end down. What is it? head, thorax, abdomen, they stick their abdomen down and they've got a gland at the bottom there which releases a pheromone and makes a track, a scent track of the pheromone there and a very simple rule, they have a finite amount of pheromone in there to expend on the entire path they're making. In other words, the shorter the path, the thicker the pheromone trail is going to be. Now what you do is deal with the fact that the pheromones dissipate after a while. They evaporate and thus the thicker the path, the longer it's going to be there. You now take a second generation of virtual ants and you throw them in there and what their rule is, they wander around randomly and any time they hit a pheromone trail, they join the trail one way or the other, and they lay down a pheromone trail of their own with their abdomen. They reinforce the markings on this trail. And let 10,000 virtual ants do that for a couple of hundred or thousand rounds of generations, and they solve the traveling salesman problem for you. Because it winds up being the short paths, the more efficient ways of connecting locales will leave larger, thicker trails which are more likely to last longer and thus increase the odds that an ant wandering around randomly will bump into it and reinforce it. And what you see is initially there will be every possible path and as you run this over and over it will begin to fade out and out will emerge the more efficient ones. You can optimize the outcome doing it this way just asking virtual ants to do it for you. And amazingly, there was a paper in Science earlier this year, and it was looking at one of these versions again, in this case, attraction and repulsion rules with ants colonies setting up foraging paths, and they explicitly compared one colony to the efficiency of the distribution of the train stations in the Tokyo subway system. And what they showed was very similar solutions, but the ants had gotten a more optimal one. So what happens when billions of people are brainwashed and misled by cults that are leaving them with reduced ability to make decisions? Giving them shit for brains just so that some rich people at the top can pay a few percent less tax? This is a sign of a very deeply sick system that can't continue to function effectively. ones that were quickly driven to extinction themselves. More cases where we are getting these systems where maybe they're not just metaphorically using terms from biology, maybe they are exactly modeling the same thing and we will see more and more evidence for that. In one case, you have males being a lot bigger than females. In one case, you've got males being the same size as females. In which of those species, the first one like this, or the same size ones, in which ones would you expect to see more male aggression? First one. Okay, how come? Their bodies are built for it, which begins to tell you something. Their bodies are built for it, maybe because females have been selecting for that. You will see higher levels of aggression in species like this, where there's a big body size difference. Um, much less of it in these guys. In primate species of this profile, you always see twinning. And they both survive. And what studies have shown in these species, and we'll get to them shortly, is after birth, in fact, the males are expending more calories taking care of the offspring than the females. Go bail out on him and go find some other hot guy, which in your species counts as some guy who looks even more like you than he does in terms of what you want out of the individual, so that. So what have we done here? We've just gone through applying these principles in this logical way and everybody from the very first step was getting the right outcome and go, and these are exactly the profiles you find in certain species. Among social mammals, these would be referred to as a tournament species. A tournament species, whereas the one on the right is referred to as a pair bonding, a monogamous species. Because in this one, males and females stay together because they both have equivalent investment in taking care of the kids, all of that. What you have here is this contrast between tournament species and pair bonding species. Tournament species, these are all the species where you get males with big, bright plumage. 
These are peacocks. These are all those bird and fish species where the males are all brightly colored. What are the females choosing for? Peacock feathers does not make for a good peacock mother. Peacock feathers are signs of being healthy enough that you can waste lots of energy on these big, stupid, pointless feathers. That's a sign of health. That's a sign of all I'm getting from this peacock is genes. I might as well go for good ones. That's the world of peacocks. That's the world of chickens with pecking orders, dominating like that, lots of aggression. That's the world of primates where, as in savanna baboons, the male is twice as big as the female, tournament species where a lot of passing on of genes is decided by male-male aggression in the context of tournaments, producing massive amounts of variability in reproductive success, where males are being selected for being good like this, so they sure are being selected for having big bodies, which winds up meaning a shortened lifespan for a bunch of reasons. Females are choosing for that. These are guys who are not using their energy on parental behavior. Thus, you do not want to have twins if you were a female baboon, and you do not want to bail out on the kids because nobody else is going to take care of them. Go and look at a new primate species and see this much of a difference in skull size, and you have just be able to derive everything else about its social behavior. Meanwhile, these guys on the right, pair bonding species, these are found among South American monkeys, marmosets, tamarins. You put up a picture of them, which I will do if I ever master PowerPoint in some subsequent lecture. You put up a picture of a marmoset pair, and you can't tell who's the male and the female. This is not the world of mandrel baboons with males with big, bright, bizarre coloration on the face and with antlers when the females don't and that whole world of sexual dimorphism. You can't tell which one is the male and which one is the female marmoset by looking at them. You can't tell by seeing how long they live. You can't tell by how much they're taking care of the kids. You can't tell in terms of their reproductive variability. That's a whole different world of selection all of the South American tamarins and marmosets, the females always twin. They have a higher rate of cuckoldry of abandoning the kids. The males take as much care, if not more, of the kids than the female does. Very low levels of aggression, same body size, same lifespan. All the males have low degree of variability. How come? Because if you're some marmoset male, you don't want to get 47 marmoset females pregnant because you are going to have to take care of all the kids. Because as we will see way down the line in lectures on parental behavior, the wiring there is such is bonding with the offspring and taking care of them. No wonder among species like these, you have very low variability. All the males reproduce once or twice. This is the world of 5% of the guys accounting for 95% of the matings. This is totally remarkable because, again, that starting point, you start off here and you look at these and, oh, you can tell if they were bipedal and or they diseased and malnourished simply by applying these principles of individual selection, reciprocity, all of that. One factoid, you see a new primate species and you see one nursing and one with a penis and they're the same size or they're as different to the size and you already know all about their social system very consistent across birds, across fish, across primates, of course, all of those, this dichotomy between tournament species and pair bonding species. As we will see way down the line, among some species, types of voles, rodents, that are famous in Hallmark cards for their pair bonding, for their monogamy, so we'll see, they're not quite as monogamous as you would think, but nonetheless, a general structure like this. So, one asks, expectedly, where do humans fit in on this one? Where do humans fit? And the answer is, complicatedly. Are we a tournament species? Are we a pair bonding species? What's up with that? What we will see is we're kind of in between. When you look at the degree of sexual dimorphism, we are not like baboons, but we're sure not like marmosets. We're somewhere in the middle. Variability is somewhere in the middle there. I'm not going near that one. Lifespan, the dimorphism in lifespan tends to be in between, and parental behavior and likelihood of all of those. You look at a number of measures, and by next lecture, we will be looking at some genetics of what monogamous species and tournament species look like, and we're right in the middle. In other words, that explains like 90% of literature because we're not a classic tournament species and we're not a classic pair bonding one. We are terribly confused in the middle there. 
and everything about anthropology supports that. Sapolsky explains, hum humans uniquely exist with a mixture of both communal and individualistic tendencies, known in the scientific world as tournament versus pair bonding species. All of the evidence suggests that this tendency has greatly improved our success as a species, but those tendencies, distorted too far one way or another, lead to pathologies and the worst collective misdeeds and wars. As Professor Sapolsky also explains in his brilliant lectures, complex adaptive systems begin to break down if the signals from coming from the randomness is suppressed or repressed, it interferes with the functioning of the whole system. Order completely begins to break down because of the butterfly effect. I've condensed the most important parts of Sapolsky's lectures into a YouTube video if you're interested in learning more. You should definitely check that out in the link that I've posted down below. Finding other optimal solutions together. I think the majority of the people on the right genuinely do want to help society by bringing order using a top-down in draconian measures if necessary. Whereas the left generally wants to help society by proactively building up, but I think both of these approaches are necessary for a healthy functioning society to exist. It seems our tendency to harness both traits and to focus intently on one or the other is both our greatest strength and also our greatest weakness. And similarly, on an individual level, I believe our greatest strength and our greatest weakness is the fact that our brains work efficiently by categorizing information and filtering out the unimportant bits that slow us down. But finding that balance between cooperation versus competition on an individual and a collective level seems to be one of the most rewarding and challenging endeavors. Being able to walk the path, as the Buddhists might say, between living for yourself and living for others. As the book by Daniel Kahneman, Thinking Fast and Slow brilliantly explains, the slow, deliberate, considered thinking takes energy and time so our brains develop filters which come out as biases. This is an inherent weakness of our brain. Consider the butterfly effect for just one person who has been influenced by the brain worms of QAnon cults and conspiracies, which distort their internal models of the world that they use to filter information. The sad and shocking stories on forums like QAnon casualties show the devastating effects on people with their close families and friends, amplified by their ever-increasing disconnected lives. Now scale that up to the level of a whole country, or a nation, or the world. This is a collective madness to cope and avoid the reality facing us as a species. Yet only collective action with agreed upon basic facts to work from will do to avoid total destruction and descent into chaos. TLDR, final thoughts. In this video essay, I've put forward the case for the four key arguments being true, and I've presented supporting evidence and logical reasoning for why I think our current definitions need updating and their threat levels reassessed from a non-hysterical but crit critical perspective. The overall claims I've made are number one, modern fascism has taken over right-wing populism and bears all the hallmarks of 20th century fascism. Number two, the ideology has two core reasons to exist and two distinct audience types which both have a symbiotic pathological relationship with each other. Number three, the main flaws and weaknesses of fascist ideology remain the same as ever, that fascism is motivated by irrational fears, greed and self-deception. Number four, modern fascism has major unforeseen damaging consequences for individuals, governments and organisational dynamics, and society at large. This reality is something that I think that a lot of people who have been influenced by this propaganda know deep down on some level, that they are avoiding the realities of pandemics, ecological harms and ignoring science and reality as it really is. They ignore it because fantasies are much simpler to understand and a narrative based on fear of others is much simpler to process in a complex world. It's also attractive to the part of us that is drawn to conflict and drama, that part of us that hungers for something genuinely interesting to happen. But I would argue from my experience that the beautiful complexity of life in all its shades of grey is much more interesting, fun and genuinely fulfilling to understand and engage in even if it might be harder to deal with, and even harder to explain. I believe doing so is vital for the very survival of our species. We can no longer afford to live in a fantasy. We need to collectively take responsibility for the world as it exists in reality. Thank you for watching my video, and thank you to the support from my patrons. Please consider helping me make more content like this, either directly as a one-off payment, or regularly through Patreon, which helps me to survive and eat. I hope all of this made sense and was as enjoyable and interesting for you to watch as it was for me learning all of these things too. As I've said, I highly encourage you to go and watch the four-part video that I've created with Robert Sapolsky, or if you've got it in you, watch the whole 20-odd lectures 
that he's got up there. Also, another book that's inspired me was A Theory of Power by Jeff Fayle. I've left the links for all the books and references down below. Thanks. Bye.